That was good singing, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely, amen to that. Okay, so we have uh, sound. Yes, you can hear me. Yes, that's nice. Thank you, Freddie. So I do want to welcome all of you this afternoon to our Father's Day service. And a special word of welcome to our friends watching us online. We have some visitors in our midst, so I do want to say welcome to our Father's Day service at the Fairview Church of God. And uh, let us continue to pray for Pastor Roger and Dina as they travel. And uh, that God would continue to be with them and they would have a meaningful time at uh, the convention. Now, uh, I do want to give you an update on uh, our ministry, I'm sorry, our, our fellowship purpose group. And uh, when I walked in, uh, Marlies gave me some good news. If you recall my previous or the last update, I said only four people had signed up. You remember that conversation? Uh, you're pretending I never had this conversation with you. And uh, Marlies gave me the good news today that we are up to 14. And uh, that is uh, a great surge in numbers, if I may say that. And so thank you very much for all of you who signed in. And if you still haven't done so, a gentle word of encouragement to do so, so that uh, we will know exactly how we need to plan things out. So this, as you know, is uh, an initiative from the Purpose Group to get our church back in terms of building community. And one of the things that uh, any church growth researcher or any church growth consultant will tell you is that building community is a very vital element if you want to see people bond and grow as the family of God and even reach out. That sense of community must be reinforced and strengthened. So please come alongside, support Marlis and the group. And Marlis, uh, is there anything you want to tell us by way of an update? We're all good, okay, 14, four to 14 is a great jump. So I just want to say, uh, keep it up, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, we want to welcome you and I'd like to begin with a little story. So I want to share with all the men, this is one of those Sundays where we want to celebrate. We are celebrating fathers, we are celebrating our grandfathers and all that the men in our lives have done for us. And so very rarely, do we men get a chance to celebrate? Would you agree? Let me tell you this. There were two men who were talking about the world. And one man said, you know, people think this is a man's world. But the truth is, this is not a man's world. And the other man said, yes, that's very true. Because when a man is born, what do they ask? How is the mother doing? Then when a man gets married... They say, how beautiful is the bride. And then when a man dies, as he lies at peace finally in the coffin, so to speak, they come and they all start talking and they say, and they ask, we hope he left something behind for the family. So you see, in every stage of life, it's never a man's life. It's never a man's world. So I say this to all the men, celebrate days like this where we can truly praise God and celebrate all that he has done in our fathers, through our fathers, and we praise God for them. Now, uh, as we gather this Sunday to celebrate Father's Day, we are very aware that our Lord has used our fathers he has used them to bless us, to bring us to where we are today. Our fathers have been great heroes, our grandfathers and men who have been used of God in so many different ways to bring us to where we are. But we are also mature enough to recognize that our fathers, our grandfathers and all the significant men in our lives were men with flaws were men with flaws and limitations. They had their own odd ways, and some of us might even say they had their faults, they had their, their, their quirks, their, their little kings in the armor, as we would call them. But through it all, and above all of that, the Lord used them 
our fathers, our grandfathers, and all the men who matter in our lives to instill values and to bring us to where we are today. And so on a Sunday like this, we truly praise God for our fathers and all the men whom the Lord has used to build us, to mature us, and to bring us to this situation in life. But we are also aware that there are quite a number of families that are unable to celebrate this achievement of men and fathers and all those who played the roles of fathers in their lives. Many studies indicate that about 33% of families are not able to celebrate, are not able to look and say, here is somebody who played a significant role in my life as a father. So if you look at the numbers, that's pretty high. 33% of children or families are, able, are, not, are not able to say, well, I do have somebody who played this role. It is because of passing on, because of death. It is because of the fact that they are absent. Or it is because there is some dysfunctionality that has caused these children to grow without a father figure in their lives. And so we ask ourselves the question, we have great men who have impacted our lives, our fathers whom we celebrate today. But the reality is also something that we cannot forget, that there are people out there who are struggling because of the dysfunctionalities or the difficulties they have experienced in this role in their families. And how then, as the people of God, should we celebrate Father's Day? How then, as the people of God, must we respond to Father's Day? So my plan this afternoon is very simple. I am going to suggest a twofold response as the people of God as to how we can respond meaningfully on this Father's Day. A twofold response and then we will play a short video. It's just eight minutes long. It's the story of Ron Archer. Now, we all know our fathers. We know of men who have played the roles of fathers, built us up to where we are. Even if we have dysfunctionalities in terms of our relationships with our fathers, we still know who our fathers are. But the story of Ron Archer, as you will see in the video, is a very sad story where to this day, Ron Archer does not know who his father is. And as he tells his story, you will recognize this is frightful, this is painful. But he ends his story talking about the great work that God did in his life. So that's really the plan for this afternoon. Twofold purpose, twofold response and then the video from the life of Ron Archer. The first response that we can possess as the children of God, as the people of God, is to remember, return, revisit, call it what you will, go back to the biblical understanding that God is our Father. The role of God as Father. Now, the role, of God, the role of God as father, or the term father, is the most consistent term that you will find used to refer to God from Genesis all the way through the Old Testament to the New Testament. And you might say, how so in Genesis? In Luke chapter 3, we won't bring it up, Luke chapter 3, all the way towards the end of the chapter, you will see a reference that might surprise you. Now, Luke chapter 3 is about genealogies. And it has names and names and names. Now, Luke chapter 3 is what I recommend you read if you are having difficulty in sleeping. Now, sometimes people say count sheep. But that's, that's an old-fashioned uh, method. If you're having difficulty in sleeping, read Luke chapter 3, it will work. Because you have just a boring list of names. But when we come 
to the end of Luke chapter 3, we see it says that Enosh was the son of Seth, and Seth was the son of Adam, and then it says, and Adam was the son of God. And I like that verse because it tells me not only was God Adam's creator, but he was also Adam's father. So the biblical understanding of fatherhood goes back to creation. And then when we get to Deuteronomy, we get into all the books of the Pentateuch. We see that God is projected, God relates to his people as a father. In fact, we'll bring up one verse, I believe uh, Duchesne will help us with that. In Isaiah 64 verse 8, it says, Yet, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, you are the potter, and we are all the work of your hand. Now, God has been referred to in quite a few ways as he relates to his people. But the most consistent term of reference is God the Father. From Genesis right through the Pentateuch into the prophets, and here you will see God is addressed as the Father, our Father. And then the next line says, we are the clay, and you are the potter, O God, and we are all the work of your hand. And it's very clear that God is shaping and forming and patterning us so that we become more and more like his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes we behave... Sometimes we behave and we'd like to think that we are the potters and God is the clay. And even though we are God's children, God is our father, we tell God what to do with our lives. And Isaiah 64 verse 8 is a very clear description that God is our father and we under his, are under his hands, we are being worked on all the time. We are work in progress, we are works in progress and he is the master potter. So we see right through scripture that there is this consistent reference that God is indeed our father. Let's move on to another reference, our next reference. And this is Psalm 103 verse 13. You will see quite a number of this in the book of Psalms. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Again, you will see that pattern, that reference to God as our Father. And this goes on. We get to the New Testament. We will see in the Gospels. We will see in the writings of the Apostle Paul, where he says, I bow my knee before God the Father. And then, of course, all this culminates in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ when he told his disciples, when, when they asked him, how do we pray? He said, begin your prayer saying what? Our Father. He didn't say address God as our teacher, our instructor, our, you know, whatever else, but he says our Father. And so we see that this pattern, this term of reference is a very consistent one. And so what do we know? That God has been our Father from creation. And this comes to a head when we see in John chapter 1 verse 12, we won't read it, but I can tell you what it is. Jesus says, I'm sorry, in the gospel of John, we see, but as many as received him, that is our Lord Jesus Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So God has been our father. And when we invite the Lord Jesus Christ into our lives as our Lord and Savior, we begin that personal intimate relationship with him as a father. And so we might have difficulties, dysfunctionalities, we might have past experiences that might cloud certain relationships, but as we come to Jesus, and through Jesus Christ, we become the children of God. We become sons and daughters of God, and God is our eternal father. And so that's the first response. We celebrate Father's Day 
we come to Father's Day, we talk about Father's Day, recognizing that God our Father is our eternal loving Father. And He is the one who has enabled us to enjoy and experience these blessings that we have with our earthly heavenly fathers. The, the second response that I want to share with you is uh, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15, where we say that while we now know God the Father in a very personal way, we are called to serve with the mindset of fathers. Now in this verse, this is the Apostle Paul talking, and he is writing to the Corinthian church. And what does he say? He says, you have, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Now the apostle Paul is telling the Christians, the believers uh, in Corinth, he says, you've had many instructors. And even in our lives today, we have instructors. We have driving instructors. We have instructors at school. We have instructors in our workplace. We have instructors in different spheres in life. And all these instructors do is they give us instructions. They tell us what to do. Think about the driving instructor or any other instructor. They come, they do their part, and then they're gone until they come back again. But the Apostle Paul here is saying, you have many instructors. In other words, you have many voices. You have many people who tell you what to do. And then he says, you do not have many fathers. I find that contrast very powerful because he's saying, you have people who tell you what to do. But I have become your father in the faith. And in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. As we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, we recognize that he was a father to many. Many scholars believe that the Apostle Paul was not a biological father. That he never had children of his own. He never had sons and daughters of his own. But we know that in the ministry, as he traveled, wherever he went, he was able to invest, he was accessible, and he was able to direct the lives of many young people, men and women. We think of Titus. We think of Timothy. And if you get to a passage like Romans chapter 16, you see that whole chapter is full of names. People who were involved in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I would like to suggest that the mindset of fatherhood is something that we can all possess and something that we can all use as we minister in God's name. Wherever God takes us, we invest our time, we direct the lives of people, we, we make sure we are accessible to them so that anytime they are in need, they can receive access, they can come and receive of ministry and we can reflect that mindset of fatherhood. As I close, as I said, I want to share the life of Dr. Ron Archer. Now he tells his story in this very short video, but the point I want to make is that as you watch the video, you will realize that he never had a biological father. To this day, he doesn't know who his biological father was, is. But he says there were people whom God brought into his life and who continued to minister to him with the mindset of fatherhood so that through them, God was able to bring Ron Archer to where he is today. So this is the twofold response that we need to have on Father's Day. And now let's watch the video and then I will come back and close this part of the service. I was 10 years old and I held my mother's gun to my head and I wanted to blow my brains all over her wall. You must stop to ask the question, why would a 10 year old boy want to die? 
10 is a time of dreaming of being an astronaut, a football star, a pastor. But for me, the thinking was, if the next 10 years are anything like the last 10 years, I didn't want any more years. I took the gun and put the barrel to my temple, closed my eyes, and pulled the trigger. A little backstory. My family's biracial. My grandmother comes from a little town in Germany called Berncastle Kuss. She was so tall and thin and white, we nicknamed her French Fry. <laughs> my grandfather migrated from Cuba. He was big, black, and burly. He was purple black, so we called him Hamburger. <laughs> Hamburger met French Fry in Cleveland, Ohio, and they made a happy meal. and they produced seven McNuggets with special sauce. <laughs> All was going well for these immigrants until one day my grandfather made a fatal mistake and hit a man and almost broke his neck. He went to jail, then soon after, my grandmother lost half her face to cancer and the family lost everything. They became homeless. My uncles joined a gang called the Devil's Disciples. And my mother, who was the oldest of the seven, got sex trafficked raped repeatedly at age 14. And at age 16, she got pregnant. We call that having a trick baby, where a woman who's a prostitute turns a trick, gets pregnant, and the men who owned her said, this baby's got to die. Three attempts at abortion, two in Cleveland and one in New York, and by the grace of God, that baby was born premature, but all messed up. Ear, nose, and throat did not connect, learning disabilities, small bladder, a mess. Went to school and was called the retardo because he couldn't learn. And that kid was me. I know what it's like to feel like the least of these, to be rejected and hated and despised. I remember my mother would go out and do her prostitution work and left me with a babysitter who would call her drunk friends together. They would party in the basement and do a game called pin the tail on the donkey. They would strip me butt naked, put me on the floor, grab a broomstick and sodomize me and say, squeal, donkey, squeal. When you get raped like that as a child, you learn four things. Don't talk, don't trust, don't feel and try to pretend it's not happening to you. Bleeding, broken, battered, abused. We were atheists. There was no God. There was no Bible. There was no prayer. And I took that gun and said, I've had enough. And I put it to my temple and my mother had enough sense to put a safety on the gun so it wouldn't engage. And I went back to my little closet bedroom where I lived and I hit my head against the wall and I cried out to the universe, help me. I didn't know how to pray, help me. I didn't know the Lord's prayer, I knew no scripture. I just cried out in my brokenness, in my desperation, bleeding and hurting. What did I do to deserve this? Help me. And as bad as that was, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what I do know. There is a God who sits up high and looks low and hears the cries of his children. Because that next week, in my inner city ghetto school, a new teacher joined the staff. Her name was Mrs. Spears, an old blue-haired white lady with a Gideon Bible that could choke a donkey. <laughs> and she said to the principal... I've been sent here for your worst kids. He said, well, I got one for you. He wets the bed, he stutters, he's suicidal, he can't learn. She said, oh, that's the one. And she walked into my little room where I was. They put me in a boiler room where I would finger paint all day. And she came in, hi, baby. My name is Miss Spears. I come from Mississippi. I said, oh, a Holy Ghost filled Julie Andrews. How nice. They told me you can't talk. Listen, honey, God don't make no junk. I've learned, boy, that God uses greatly those who've been wounded very deeply. 
can I help you to talk? I said, yeah, 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 yes, ma'am. She said, first of all, do you know that you're in the Bible? I said, ma'am, you don't know my family. We're not in the Bible. We don't, we don't even own a Bible. She said, no, no, baby. I want you to know you in the Bible. Can I show you? I was excited. I'm in the Bible. I know Charleston Heston was in the Bible. <laughs> Let my people go. Yeah, I was ready. She said, now, I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 1 and read this because this is you. So I was excited, turned the Bible, first time ever touching the Bible, opening up the Word of God, not just any other book, but the living, dynamic, effervescent, pedantic Word of the living God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. My Word should come back, not to me empty, but do that which I called it to do. So I was excited, and I read for the first time something called hope. And it reads thusly, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And before you came forth, I set you apart to be a messenger unto me. Then it said, but I cannot speak, for I'm only a child. And God said, do not say you're only a child, for I will put my words in your mouth. And wherever I shall send you, you shall speak for me. And do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, saith the Lord. Do you know when you put the word of God into a young, broken, ghetto child's life, the light of the living God, the word that changes the vernacular activating system of the mind. I walked on clouds, took that Bible, had to hide it because we're atheists. And I took that book home and I read all these dysfunctional people who were just like me. I couldn't believe that God could use them. And I memorized over 2,000 scriptures because I didn't know when I would, I would lose my Bible. But when you put that kind of scripture in the mind of a child, something is changing. Something is metamorphosized. I came back. I was such a bad stutterer. But after reading about Moses being a stutterer, I couldn't get enough. I came back. I was the lowest kid in my class. Wet the bed. Retarded, they called me. His name is Renardo. He is a retardo. He sits on the steeple. When he talks, he spits at the people. But I got a loving Christian teacher who gave me the word of God. And after that, I graduated number one in my class, valedictorian, student body president. Don't tell me what God cannot do. Don't tell me the Holy Spirit can't change the head, the heart, the hands, the habits of humanity. I believe the message is very clear, isn't it? What the Lord can do with people who are available. And uh, my encouragement this afternoon is there are many Ron Archers out there. And God has called us to be the Mrs. Spears in the lives of the many Ron Archers out there. And there is a ministry where if we possess the mindset of fathers, we can go out there and just like what Mrs. Spears did, we can invest, we can make ourselves available, and we can disciple and mentor men and women who can turn out to be like this man of God, Ron Archer. So may God bless us as we continue to ponder on what we have seen, what we have reflected this afternoon, that God is our Father, but we are also called to reflect the mindset of fatherhood. And a very appropriate hymn, the worship team will come and lead us in Find Us Faithful. <laughs>